Coming up next on America's Voice, some say the problem with the 1970s was the Vietnam War, which pitted generation against generation. Others say Watergate fostered distrust in government and other institutions that we once held dear. Well, today we're going to talk with an author who says that's all true, but there's more to the 1970s than you might think. We'll also get your thoughts on the me decade. So get ready. Take action now begins right now. Live from Washington, D.C., this is Take Action Now. And hello and welcome from your nation's capital. I'm Bill Horman. Just think back. Brown and orange furniture, polyester suits, shag carpet, LPs, gold chains, mood rings, wood grain, side paneled pinto station wagons, hot combs, disco, groovy sayings like keep on trucking and damn straight, all bring back memories of the 1970s. Social critics call it the me decade. Others, like our guests, say it was much more than that. David Frum has just written a book on the decade which he says shaped modern America and altered the American personality. His book is called How We Got Here, the 1970s, the decade that brought you modern life, for better or worse. But we want to know what you think as well. Were the 1970s the best of times? Were they the worst of times, or were they somewhere in between? one eight seven seven Anvoice is our telephone number. We start our conversation with David Frum. I love the book. Love the book, but I've got to know, why did you decide to write a book about the 70s? Isn't that a decade most people would want to forget? Well, I don't blame them for wanting to forget it. It's a very unsightly time. I think that the 70s, a lot of their importance gets ignored because they were so physically hellacious. Nobody wants to look back at the old pictures, certainly not his own old pictures. No. You know, I, I was bar mitzvahed in... Um, uh, the summer of 1973, and there's a photograph of me, age 13, and sort of massive curly hair, brown polyester, seer striped seersucker suit. It's not in the book. Oh, darn. <laughs> um, big brown Bozo the Clown bow tie with right. white polka dots. I mean, it's humiliating. It's absolutely awful. Well, my senior prom, I wore a powder blue uh, tuxedo with a thick black <laughs> yeah. velvet. Darn it, I wish I had thought to bring that thing. And you can have a lot of fun with the 1970s. There's the clogs and the smiley faces yeah. and all that. Uh, pseudo hippie stuff, post hippie yes. stuff, but the 70s were an interesting decade for the social revolutions that came about, and that's what you talk about in yes. your book. You know, the 60s, n n the change of the 70s didn't start in the 70s. They start in the 60s or even earlier. Mm -hmm. The thing that I'm interested in is the moment at which changes that originated earlier become universal. So it isn't that the 70s invent pot smoking. Pot mm -hmm. smoking is invented before, but before 1970, pot smoking is something done by student radicals, jazz musicians, a tiny elite few. As late as 1967, only 5% of Americans have ever tried marijuana, according to the Drug Enforcement Agency statistics. By 1976, one third of Americans have, and one half of Americans under the age of 30. So it's in the 70s that these fringe or elite experiments come to a living room near you. I hope I don't offend you with this remark, but a lot of folks read Halberstam's book, The 50s, in which he says a lot of that social change that we experienced in the 60s really began in the 1950s, actually post-war in the late 40s. Your book sort of sets out uh, with the same sort of premise, does it not? Well, I, I would say, um, look, many of these changes go back much farther than that. Right. I mean, that, uh, the uh, changes in attitudes towards sexuality and so on, they can be traded, traced back to before the First World War. I'm not interested in the mo moment at which a few people started to experiment with this. The, my story, mm -hmm. I, I shouldn't say I'm not interested, that's not my story. My story is the story at which these things became ubiquitous, at which divorce became a universal experience, at which drug experimentation became a universal experience. Um, at the moment at which main, uh, the mainstream Protestant churches flipped over and their members evacuated in enormous numbers for the evangelical churches. At the moment, by the way, because this is also part of the story of the 1970s, when the Democratic Party imploded, when the social democratic idea failed, and when the new political forms that have dominated American life since the 70s took root. The seven, one of the great political stories of the 70s is the story of the rise of the right, right. And, and the rise of the Republican Party. And that's part of the same story, and you have to be able to see it all as one story. I found this quote very interesting. Scott, if we could go to this quote. It's about, in your book, you, you write, Since World War II, the mood of the country has reflected the moods of the colossal baby boom generation. Rebellious when the boomers were teenagers, the 60s. Lustful when the boomers hit their 20s, the 70s. Covetous as they entered their 1930s. This book 
is quintessentially about the baby boomers and how they affected their time. Um, one thing that affected the baby boomers was the Vietnam War. You don't discount the Vietnam War as being very important yeah. to the ethos of the 1970s, but you don't think it's all inclusive of Vietnam. I also think our story about Vietnam is usually wrong. I mean, the, the, the conventional story is that uh, the Vietnam is the elders' war. The elders maneuver the country into it, and then the young men and women, but especially the young men, are angry and re resentful, and they form protest movements, and it's out of the um, experience of protest that we get the politics of our time. That's not true at all. It's, uh, that's one of those things. It isn't even, I mean, close to being true. There, in fact, every poll taken during the Vietnam War showed the most hawkish segment of the population mm -hmm. to be young men, 18 to 24. And what happened during Vietnam was, uh, the, yes, the country turned against the war, but they didn't buy the anti-war argument. They turned against the war because they didn't think the war was going to be waged in a rational way. And obviously, if, if, if the question is, if the question proposed you know, to the viewers of America's Voice, a pretty robust group of Americans, <laughs> hey, how about this plan? Why don't we aimlessly bomb North Vietnam with no coherent strategic idea, having young, uh, young men die in the tens of thousands while they mosey around the jungle, never really engaging with the enemy as we pursue endless negotiations? Most people say, that sounds like a stupid plan. Mm -hmm. And it was a stupid plan. But it wasn't, the, the, the reaction was not a pacifist reaction. In fact, it was in many ways an ultra hawkish one. Now, when the war is then lost. That, I think, uh, does, um, does tend to have a big impact because th tens of thousands, 50,000 young men died. And at the end of the war, they say not only is it all for nothing, but just as an extra little bit of spite, when we leave, we are going to deny our former ally the guns and fuel mm -hmm. it needed to have any hope of survival. I argue in how we got here that, in fact, based on a lot of research by other people, that the odds were pretty good for the South Vietnamese. Not great, not perfect, if but we pretty good. If we some support afterwards. If, if the United States had funded them just at the levels it had promised to do so, mm -hmm. uh, they would have had a real chance. Now, this book is not about Vietnam, but Vietnam keeps coming up in people's memories about the 1970s, as does Watergate. Got about 90 seconds left in this segment. Tell us a little about Watergate and how that sort of fostered the opinions of the 1970s. Well, Nixon was, in many ways, a normal Cold War president. There was very little he did that his predecessors hadn't done. What I say in how he got here is not that the 70s were mistrustful of government because Watergate became a scandal. Watergate became a scandal because Americans were mistrustful of government. Their attitudes changed, and that turned what had been normal behavior for Roosevelt, Truman, Kennedy, and so on, into a national scandal. And I would think that because of the sort of distrust of all the externals, people started to turn and look more at themselves, the self-help books, the, the self-esteem books, and so forth. We'll talk about that movement. Remember the I'm okay, you're okay? Remember that book? Your parents probably, you probably had it on your bookshelf. We're going to talk about that sort of self-help movement in our next segment. More about the 1970s with our guest when we return. Stay tuned. But I'm trying to focus on the president. And what did the president know and when did he know it? I began by telling the president that there was a cancer growing on the presidency. People have got to know whether or not their president is a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. I think of all the fads, these are the most quintessentially 70s. There's the pet rock and then there's the god-awful leisure suit. David, of course, I, I know you had one. Admit it, we all had one in the 1970s. Yeah, uh, I have to admit, I didn't have a leisure suit, but what I did have that it was maybe even more embarrassing uh -huh. was I had a kind of silk scarf that you wore instead of a necktie with your open neck shirt. I did have one of those. Okay, well, David Frum's telling us a little bit about himself, but he's written this wonderful book about the 1970s, and it isn't just fun stuff about the fads and the freaky things that happened. It's also about the revolutions that actually coalesced in the 1970s. Whenever they developed, they coalesced, in his opinion, in the 1970s. His book is called How We Got Here in the 1970s. And we want to know what you think about that decade. 1-877-AMVOICE is our telephone number. And if you want to read the first chapter of the book online for free, you can do that. The address is David from F-R-U-M, davidfrum.com. You can get it free on the Internet. We were showing some fads there, and the 70s were filled with this sort of self-help type fadish that's stuff. That's right, but it's, it, it's not a joke. It's serious stuff. I'd like mm -hmm. to read something, if I sure. may. This is from Jerry Rubin. The, remember Abby Hoffman's friend who disrupted the 1968 Democratic Convention? It's from his autobiography. In five years, from 1971 to 1975, I directly experienced est, gestalt therapy, bioenergetics, rolfing, massage, jogging, 
health foods, Tai Chi, Esalen, hypnotism, modern dance, meditation, Silva mind control, Arika, <laughs> acupuncture, sex therapy, Reishian therapy, and Morehouse. Now, don't worry if you haven't heard of all of those. Maybe <laughs> a loss in the There's a reason time. why you haven't heard but of all of them. What, what, what I think what it indicated was something very serious, which is um, that in many ways, the protest movements of the 60s, frightening and terrifying as they seemed at the time, were very old-fashioned things. They had a lot more, in, Abby Hoffman in many ways is much more in common with people 30 years older than himself than he does with 10 years, people 10 years younger. Mm -hmm. The idea that, hey, there are things wrong with American society, why don't we get a bunch of people together and organize some kind of political protest force to achieve changes in the law that will solve problems. That is, in fact, quite an old-fashioned idea. It looks back to the Depression. It looks back to the days of Woodrow Wilson and Teddy Roosevelt. The coming thing is what Jerry Rubin is talking about here, which is we don't believe anymore in collective political action. What we believe in is self-improvement, self-perfection. Yeah, which to me just smacks of narcissism, which is really the criticism of the baby boom generation. Uh, they didn't want to fight a war, and then in the 1970s after the war, it was all this me, me, me stuff, and you and I were talking about this, this uh, Ice Storm movie that was released in the 1990s, which reflected back on the 70s, and it, it, it did reveal a lot of this narcissism. Now, before we kick the baby boomers around the block one, one more time, not, okay. that they, not that they don't deserve sure, it. Sure. It, it, it should be pointed out that the, one of the worst consequences of the 1970s is the divorce boom. Right. A million American kids lose their parents or homes to divorce in each and every year of the 70s. Those people who are getting those divorces in 1971, 72, 73 are not baby boomers. The baby boomers are too young. That, that in fact, is the 1930s generation. It is the, 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 divor the first group of people to divorce en masse are the people who were born between 1930 and 1940. And, I mean, the baby boomers then uh, pick up the flag and run with it. Mm -hmm. but it is actually, a, a, um, it is actually a, a slightly older group of people who introduce these changes into adult, uh, in, into adult life in, in big numbers. Uh, part of it, now the baby boomers are influential in this way. You know, a lot of the way re the relations between men and women go are determined just by demographics. That one of the, because men tend to marry a little, women a little bit younger than them, one of the most important ratios in society is the ratio between the number of, say, men in their mid-twenties and women in their early twenties. Very important ratio. Mm -hmm. In the early 1970s, that r ratio favors men more radically than ever. There are five mar marriageable women for every four marriageable men just because of the, w the shape of the baby boom slope. Now, Bad news for those of you born after 1973 that the, on the downward slope that the trend operates in reverse, that today the odds are very much in favor of the girls and against the boys. But that sense that there are girls everywhere and they'll put up with whatever and you, uh, you, you do to them and plus any you know, moderately successful 40-year-old man can cash in his wife and take up right. with the That is actually based on real demographic reality. Well, remember the Geritol commercial, My Wife. I think I'll keep her. Yeah. Uh, take a phone call, one eight seven seven am voice Here's Jack in Oregon. you got about 30 seconds in this segment. Jack, go ahead. Hey there, Bill. Hey. Uh, you know, the 60s really went from about 1965 through 75, and there were so many, should we say, political diversions within the 70s. Uh, like you, you were talking about the Vietnam War, I'll put the disco era in there also. People to totally tuned out Washington, D.C., so they don't really know what was going on back there. Thank God for C-SPAN getting in there in late 79. But, you know, there are so many diversions like the music business. I'm, a, unfortunately, a union member, and I was working so hard back then in those days, and I was also a rock musician. Your mind is not on politics. Your mind is elsewhere. So when people wake up out of the coma of the 70s and possibly a part of the 80s, uh, this is how America is getting turned around. Yeah, Jack, thank you very much. And talking about disco, that, that sort of syncopated rhythm, really mind-numbing, sort of makes you forget everything. And I guess if you've got the spoon up your nose, that's the kind of music you wanted. We're going to talk more in our final segment about sort of the pop culture of the 1970s and the movies that spotted that decade. Back with the final segment and our guest in just a minute. Stay tuned. <laughs> String held by all those big shots. I don't apologize, that's my life, but I thought that. But when it was your time, that. that you would be the one to hold the strings. When you look back at the great movies of the decades, people like to divide time in that manner. The Godfather 1 and, and Part 2 
are right there at the top. That from Godfather One. We're talking about the 1970s with David Frum. He's the author of the book, How We Got Here, the 1970s, the decade that brought you modern life for better or for worse. And let's talk a little bit about the movies and pop culture. So little time in this segment, but generally the movies uh, come to a point with movies like Rocky and Star Wars of the little guy becoming the big hero, but it wasn't always like that. Well, I have to say, having begun by denigrating my, the bar mitzvah suit I was obliged to wear, that it has to be said, the 70s are the great age of American cinema, I, I believe. In 1969, because, because they're, they're bracketed by two events. In 1969, um, the first independent, important independent production company is launched, uh, Francis Ford Coppola's America Zoe Trope. The grip of the studios is really broken, and so directors acquire more freedom. But they're still playing to an adult audience. That the days when the 16-year-olds get to decide what is going to be a success and what isn't, which is what happens as the baby boomers age and start buying vi video cassette recorders. Mm -hmm. I mean, the VCR, in a way, you can say, kills the movies because the grown-ups stay home, watch it on video, and the kids decide what's going to be a success in the theater. Welcome the Matrix. Um, <laughs> uh, so they're, they're a great era for American movie. But what I find interesting when you say, what does this tell us? One of the things The Godfather tells us, it's a, it, that is a movie about the breakdown of order in society. That the, the makers of that movie may have thought they were making an ironic point, that in a movie in which every legal institution is corrupt, only the mafia is, has got some integrity to it. But viewers said, hey, every institution is corrupt, but here at least, I mean, they took it completely unironic. Which is why folks like The Sopranos today, in yes. a sense. Yes, that's a, because that also is about the conflict, because they're trying to live up to a code in a mm -hmm. world without codes. But there's another thing that, about the movies of the 70s that there are two other things that, that I think really need to be stressed. One is, the 70s are a time of wild promiscuity, no question. But it's not a, promis it's not a hedonistic promiscuity. It's a promiscuity of despair. That the movies like Looking for Mr. Goodbar and Saturday Night Fevers, all the movies about single life, not I should so say all, but the bulk of them, painted as dark and grim. And what they're saying is, it's because we've lost hope in the possibility of happy relations between men and women mm -hmm. that, that we are living this way. The other thing the 70s movies show is the decades great suspicion of children. That again and again in the 1970s, when a, wo when a woman tells her husband, uh, darling, I'm pregnant, you know, as sure as day follows night, that the next scene is going to show that the child is dot, 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 Satan. <laughs> <laughs> Rosemary's Baby, the two Omen movies. Right. Uh, it's Alive, uh, The Exorcist, Children Are Satan. That is a great piece of 70s belief. Uh, can we look back at the 90s? and sort of define what the 90s were. Were they a 70s redux? Is it possible that that could happen? I think the 90s are the great age of settlement, when the sediment lands on the bottom of the glass, and a society that's gone through a lot of changes settles into what those changes are going to be. Yeah. And that we can see the outcome of the, the, these, the decades, the period of tumult, the 60s are one kind of period of tumult, the 70s are a different period of tumult. Um, the, the results of those, of those tumults are in. And what we see is the free market wins. Um, there is just the, 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 the Howard, Jar it's Howard Jarvis who decides, not Abby Hoffman, who is important to the politics of, of modern life. He wins. Proposition 13. Proposition 13, the tax cutting. The Republican Party wins. The Democrats lose. On the other hand, the feminists win. The gay rights movement wins. The safety cult wins. Um, that uh, If you live in an American suburb today and you see a three-year-old on a tricycle, odds are he's going to be wearing a crash helmet. <laughs> That's yes. Ra Ralph Nader's ultimate triumph. Right. <laughs> Uh, you say that uh, politics moved right, but, um, but social trends moved left, and that's exactly what you're saying. In the last 30 seconds, can you look forward this next decade? What's that likely to shake out into? Well, I think that we're going to see more of that period of stasis. Remember, the average American is now nearly 40 years old, and in the next decade, the average American will be 40 years old. We're going to be in, I think, in many ways, for a much quieter time in which we're going to be, I think it'll be an era of retrospection and self-judgment. And really that's why I wrote How We Got Here, is to encourage that kind of retrospection and self-judgment. All right, David Frum, the book is How We Got Here, the 1970s. I love this book. You can read it free online at davidfrum.com. First chapter's online. Read it free. It's worth reading. We're going to take a look back at the 1970s, this day in history, in just a minute. You won't want to miss it. All right, these are the results from yesterday's question of the day found on our website. Do you think the religious right's influence in the Republican Party is too much? Well, here's the way you voted. 7% said, yeah, it is. 81% said religious right plays a necessary role. And welcome back to this edition of Take Action. Now, before we go, we're going to take this last word.
And since we talked about the 1970s, today we thought we'd go back in time and check out Today in History, February 29th, 1972. Just to show you how things have changed, on this date, 1972, Hank Aaron, who at the time had about 660 lifetime home runs, signed the richest contract in baseball history. Hammer and Hank signed with the Atlanta Braves for some $200,000 a year. By contrast, Mark McGuire, today's home run champ, made nearly $9 million last year. How's that for a pay raise? And that's today's last word. And that's all the time we have for this edition of Take Action Now. Coming up tonight at 7 o'clock is the First Producers Club with Tammy Haddad. At 8 o'clock, another edition of Take Action Now with Israel Balderas. Coming up tomorrow, we're going to talk about the Washington State and Virginia primaries. See you then.